Welcome back to Just Ask George. David Wolf with George Lovato Jr. George, I'm with uh, the guy that always makes me feel good, so I'm doing great. I feel good as well. You look, you? you look marvelous. Hey, hey, I feel great. It's, it's Friday. Great. We're shooting the show. We're having some fun. And this subject matter is all about you. This it's time. about me. I it's am the subject the of the... Surprise. Oh, my, oh, my goodness. In our new Just Ask George format, we're going to ask the question, how do you plan for financing? We're going to go back in time and mm. your career in a couple of different iterations of your careers and talk about not so much the need for financing in one business and then one that was very capital intense right. and what the differences were. I love that. Yeah, that's that. interesting. Yeah. That contrast is built into my, my professional <laughs> biography, so that's great stuff. So, uh, great. I'm looking forward to that, uh, and uh, let's rock and roll. We'll see you in a minute. Hey, bye-bye. Podcast and Radio.com offers turnkey content production solutions for your business enterprise, including audio podcasts, internet radio stations, and video production. For more than 25 years, media producer David Wolf has served clients worldwide, such as Southwest Airlines, McDonald's, Long John Silver's, Disney, Chuck E. Cheese Enterprises, Fast Signs, Pepsi, Frito-Lay, and many, many more. Today, podcastandradio.com serves companies of any size across a broad range of industries with content marketing they need to keep their website, email marketing, and social media channels current and engaging with fresh content. For more information, visit podcastandradio.com. George Lovato's first and very popular book, The Obstacle Course, can be purchased online at Amazon.com. The Obstacle Course chronicles the success story of George Lovato Jr.'s climb to national notoriety as he built one of America's largest car rental companies and features his harrowing story as he grabbed the brass ring by successfully taking this enterprise public in the salad days of NASDAQ. Many of the teachings in this book are still relevant today in the modern business age. The Obstacle Course is available on Amazon.com. And welcome back. David Wolf, George Lovato. George, we're going to launch into a discussion about setting up for the corporate finance. We talked in the last show about planning, staying organized, and uh, uh, all that's involved in trying to keep yourself on track with multitude of projects at the same time, making lists and... So on, and I hope that all of you got something out of that program then and understand those takeaways a little bit clearer. But a lot of people don't understand. They make a decision all of a sudden. I need capital. I got. I need a loan. I need uh, investors. I need. Yeah. And they just sort of, bleh, you know, they just sort of throw it out there. It's an emotional response to a panic or a need, or they need equipment, or they need cash flow, or a, 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 a line of credit, and, yeah. and, and in a very, very broad sense, yeah, it's like a sudden, sudden spark of, okay, I need capital. So, so I want you to go back in your career, and we'll talk a little bit about the, the jingle jangle business you right, were in, right. and that really didn't require any financing at all. I mean, it was a cash-rich, surplus-rich, liquidity-rich business. <laughs> Well, I want to put a little color on that. Um, so initially, uh, there was some capital outlay required. And in that case, it was, a, you know, strictly speaking, it was a friends and family round. My father-in-law uh, helped and my I think my parents may have come in and we contributed a little bit. I needed a small mixing board. What I was doing is uh, I was setting up to be a commercial music company in Dallas. So I needed a minimal setup, home-based kind of setup. And these days, a lot of studios are home-based, but we're talking about 30 years ago, 1985. So I got myself a Soundcraft, you know, console with multi-channel. I needed recording and multi-track. Then it was still tape. We weren't doing anything with digital yet. Then? No, not yet. Digital, not it wasn't that yet. yet. Wasn't that yet. <laughs> wasn't that yet. We'll talk about the technology is not so much, uh, it's a little bit of a tangent to the capital subject, but the equipment changes a lot in this business, in the, in the media business. And so at that particular time, it was multi-track tape. So I had a track recorder. I had a four-track. I had mastering. So there was some amount of equipment the studio needed. We're talking in the $5,000 range. So by any standard, even a small business, it's not a lot of capital. But 30 but, years ago, that 5000 was probably equivalent to maybe 20000 a day. Probably right. And we, didn't, and we paid cash for everything. We really didn't do any financing, mm -hmm. per se. Um, so... Uh, I can pause or we can continue the story. I mean, there's, there's layers to, as the company and the business evolved, we, uh, we turned some corners and needed to spend more money. And we right. did ultimately find a, uh, a bank that would support the large 
uh, equipment that we got, which ended up being what I'll call the center of the studio. And with that, uh, that bank, that was sort of an outcome of, an, of a pre-existing relationship that you had. Right. We were banking. We had a depository relationship with this bank. See, I've learned something from this guy. <laughs> and... Um, and Phyllis, who was running the business, my wife, uh, went out to them and said, look, we need this uh, Synclavier system. What is a Synclavier system? It was the sampler of its time, really the high-end stuff. Lucasfilm used these systems. And it was just the what, what they call the poly. Right. Uh, it was the poly RAM part of the equation. They had disc recorders, but we were just needing the music production side. So this was a $130,000 item. Ooh. But it would become the center of our studio mm-hmm. with a few other ancillary pieces. So we found a used one out of Nashville, and identified it. And, uh, you know, this was a big deal. They had to come out. We had to install air conditioning, UPS backup supplies. It was uh, an infrastructure investment as well as the equipment itself and memory. And back then, you know. But now business is ramped up. I mean, you're – because when you started with the initial $5,000 in the friends and family and former enemies investment, now you've stepped up to commercial financing. Right. You've gone to a bank. Right. You're in six figures now. But the business is now... Producing. Well, that's a really good point, and I completely glossed over that, folks. So so the truth is is that I found myself in a situation where I, I had a, a, an operator of this system called the Synclavier at a commercial studio that, was wor- that I would rent as I needed it. So I'd get a, a project from a client. I would go into the studio. I would rent the studio, and I would also rent the gear, this Synclavier. And finally, after a couple of years of doing that, the guy that was operating was looked at me and said, you know, you're, really, you're using this as, as much as you, anyone here. Why don't you just buy one and get your own? <laughs> and it's funny because from a business perspective, I, I, I you know, I understood that was a possibility. But so it, let's let's stop here and let's right. dissect this a little bit. So you knew in the beginning right. that you needed some footing capital, and that happened to be around five G's. Right. You were able to buy the necessary equipment at that point, right. and then time goes on, business ramps up, revenues are getting better. Yep. You have a pre-existing relationship with a commercial bank. Yes. Uh, Phyllis uh, and you discussed this and said, hey, let's go in and find out what the process is. Mm -hmm. And they tell you what they need and so on and so forth. They rebound back with a list of all these documents. You put all that together and then you submit that. It goes off into banking approval land and you get approved and you buy the equipment. Correct. Okay. Now, after that, after that was all done. Now, those are incidentally the steps involved. Okay, not yes. all of them, yes. but most of them involved in planning for financing. Okay, it's a little bit different today than it was back then because banks were the center of the universe for business capital. Right now, that's changed. As right, we, we never about thought or even considered any alternative right. or a semi-regulated lender or any of those sorts of sources. It was oh, here's our bank. Let's take them the package. Let's show them our financials. And the business was doing really well, so we more than can support it. And I should throw in, we probably paid off a five-year note in three years. So we actually accelerated smartly. Now, uh, now after that, yeah. were there any other big capital needs? Um, yeah, in the arc of the business, we, for better and worse, determined that we wanted a second studio in Santa Fe, New Mexico. We were operating out of Dallas. So we built a home and wrapped it. I said wrapped probably not the word because it's a technical financing term. But what, what we did was we planned to have a studio as part of the home. So we took the write-off and we encompassed the construction loan to accommodate the strange shaped walls we needed. And we actually built conduit. Now that brings up another good point. So again, prior planning prevents poor performance. You said we're going to expand. You knew that you could leverage the mortgage yes. and create another business asset. Yes. Okay. So there was another That's a nice element touch. of planning in that. Okay. Yes. So when we, when we get back... To first was equity, second was commercial borrowing, third was essentially leveraging or, uh, as we would say, uh, creating a business asset out of pre-existing sort of lay down type of financing that because mortgages, as we know, are relatively easy to qualify for. Exactly. And so, they, so there, there are three distinct moves you made in that period of time. That's cool the way you think of that. Those and that they time. were all different credit facilities, yep. and there was a lot of forethought 
even before you started the business, right. there was a lot of forethought in what you needed to get going, what you needed in order to lower your operating costs yes. and take advantage of direct ownership of significant equipment for the manufacturing side of your business. Exactly. And then giving you some diversity uh, geographically, you then leveraged that mortgage, that, that home ownership into developing another business asset. So in each one of those cases, there was a lot of planning, a lot of forethought, and the use of different credit facilities, okay, for different purposes. Right. Now, that brings back this point. Often, businesses don't think that way. The way they approach financing is that emotional need, that sudden revelation, I got to go do it, and they, the first thing they do is rush out the door to the bank, get turned down by the bank. You know, you don't have enough debt coverage. You're not making enough money. Your credit is terrible, blah, 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 blah brings us to the point. There's a line in the sand that occurred about 2005, six somewhere in there. And that was the beginning of the proliferation of all of these other semi-regulated lenders. Okay. It was the very start of that. And we did a Just Ask George uh, original series on uh, how the loan budget of BH Capital has changed over the years. You know, back in the day, prior to that time, that line in the sand. I'm yeah, talking about, it was it was you know five, six, seven, eight different resources that I went to: a couple of banks, a couple of insurance companies, a couple of large managed investment funds, and that that was it. That made up the loan budget. Now it's close to two hundred. Wow. Okay. Wow. And it goes up and down. It goes. I remember that 90, show. Ninety, two hundred and twenty. Yes, but it's in there. Yeah. But this is a, quite a quantity of yeah. these. Of sources these, of capital. And, and, and a very small percentage of them are the too big to fails in the regular banks. <laughs> that line in the sand also changed the dynamic of financing quite a bit. It wasn't as easy as going down and, and exploiting a pre-existing relationship with a commercial bank. Regulations have, you know, essentially drowned small business, uh, banking regulations have. And as a result, it's so much more difficult for a bank to lend today. Mm -hmm. And so... You need to plan a lot more. And we go back to another subject which says DIY doesn't work, okay, <laughs> right. because the landscape is so much more broad. I mean, it is, it's instead of 180 degrees, the landscape by the, on the horizon is really 360. It's all around us. Hmm. But trying to find the right lender for the right purpose now, it, because it's become so highly specialized... You have to plan around that. Yeah. You have to plan around it's a structural what thing. that yeah, what that specific lender needs. Yeah. George Lovato Jr. authors books that are tailor made for today's business environment. If you're an entrepreneur, business owner, or you run a business enterprise, you don't want to miss the books he's authored over the past four years, including The Obstacle Course, The Best Damn Guide to Business Finance, and George's groundbreaking ebook. How to Finance Your Business. His latest book, Higher Power Business, is a departure from his previous works and proves to be a very controversial source of discussion among its reviewers and preview readers. Higher Power Business makes the case that corporate America is conflicted and in many cases hypocritical about recognizing God in business matters. In it, Lovato states that God is already in our business, 365 days a year, and that he surrounds us 360 degrees by 360 degrees spherically. Scheduled for fourth quarter release 2017, this book is touted by many critics to be a very controversial bestseller. Put in your early order for higher power business today at bhcapitalltd.com. BH Capital Limited is celebrating over 30 years of providing proactive finance and management solutions for American enterprise. Under the leadership of George Lovato Jr., the firm exists as an expert in the complex world of structured finance, modern management strategies and techniques, and breaking the code of marketing in the modern digital age. Through its ability to lend or invest singularly or in conjunction with other institutions or investors, American Enterprise has been able to resolve many of the complex issues surrounding corporate finance as a result of BH Capital's participation. 
having assisted and advised many top American corporate executives, BH Capital Limited is a driving force in American management consulting and advisory engagements. Find out more by visiting bhcapitalltd.com. So then you move on to another business, which was very capital intense. Yes. And you needed a lot of money to execute the first part of the business plan yes. and money ongoing. Yes. Uh, how was that? How did that come about? So it was a completely different model. I mean, you, you pointed out well, and I'll just expand that a little bit. In the creative services business, most of the, the capital, aside from the fact that we needed to borrow 130000 plus, plus, plus to build this studio, the home, the, all of this, most of the value of that business was me and my capacity to write a future piece of music. So it was very much a creative services business. Right. Now, as I wound that down, as I turned to be 40, and uh, there's a whole backstory on that, but for reasons that we won't share in this particular show, because they're not uh, germane to the subject matter, uh, we wound down the music, the, the music production business and uh, took over a uh, then-bankrupt set of assets uh, – initially with an infusion of capital simply from me. And we bought those assets. This was a commercial bakery, an established business that had closed. And within a two or three month window, we got in, redeployed the business, wholesale, retail, and started. But it was a completely different business. It was in this, well, it was retail, wholesale, uh, which involved food manufacturing and processing. And then there was a delivery component as well. So I stepped into a – I remember my accountant at the time. He looked at me and said, you know, you're going to have a very, very steep learning career here. And I said, yeah, I know. And I really didn't know. But I, I acknowledged that, <laughs> that there was a lot of moving parts there. And I had some help, but it was a lot to take in. Now, from, you put you know, your – you know, as they always say, yeah. uh, investors will say, well, how much have you put in? Yeah. And in this case, you put in a pretty significant sum to launch, relaunch the business. Right. Time went on, and then you put another round of financing together. Right. Another larger six-figure round, like eight hundred thousand. Yeah. Well, that was later. Actually, we did a, a subsequent SBA, SBA facility loan, right. with one of the local banks. So this was a banking relationship that we leveraged, to put it in your terms, and uh, and that worked well. I mean, what we discovered is that we didn't know what we didn't know. So, so first of all, we had some infrastructure below the line costs that were uh, really exceeding our capacity to keep up with them, and it took me some time to catch up to understanding that was really what was going on. So. Some of the funding that I brought in ended up funding those losses. A um, large part of it was in utilities and rent because you've got freezers. You have uh, a huge facility that was 12. Numbers. It was 12,000 square foot facility of which we were probably only utilizing a third of it, maybe even less. But it was set up for, to um, expand. Ex it was set up for an expansion that I had never planned. But when I looked at, and this is kind of an interesting thing because looking back, probably would have done it differently. And that's why it's instructive. Looking back, we probably should have gotten a smaller building and just set that facility up to do what we needed. But at the time, the monumental task of taking freezers and ovens and uh, infrastructure um, and, and moving it to another place just seemed profoundly uh, yet, an impossible idea. You know. If you had to straight line that out, there would have been a significant savings over And at the time, I had an investment property that uh, we found a building that mm -hmm. we were looking at, and I could have 1031 and actually kept that asset in my Bingo. personal. So there were a lot of things there that, um, that, 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 you, that know, you, you, you learned. When you talk about that, that is, again, A, the takeaway here is DIY. Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, you actually needed outside structural help and analytical help yes. in the financing process. Yes. Uh, and it's a good example of it. I mean, no, this really, is the work yeah. you do every day. I didn't have uh, the resources it, 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 that it, uh, didn't, you it didn't happen at that yeah. point. Uh, you did, again, learning from prior experience, you leveraged a pre-existing commercial banking relationship. Right. That provided you a little more fuel in the tank. And then you did your final round. With it was a final round, was, yeah, and, which and, over time was about eight hundred nine hundred thousand dollars $900,000 to support. Uh, now, in each one of those steps, yeah. in each one of those steps, how much time of your time uh, was dedicated to focusing in and 
on the financing itself? On, on financing itself, on forming the capital. Well, because of From this, the very beginning of the music business to okay. the bagel business. So the music business didn't require a whole lot of my time. Somewhat, I think it relates to the size of the money and the fact that I did... Uh, actually, that was before Phyllis was working with me, so I was alone. But we had some resources and from family and friends, so that was an easy one. We were able to write that check. Mm -hmm. The banking relationship, there was an underwriting, uh, and that uh, Phyllis was largely involved with that, with our accountant pulling together the data that was necessary for them to do that underwriting. In the case of the home, as you pointed out, a lot of it was built, baked into the financing, but we had a build-out that we had to do. We had equipment coming. We already had that covered. There was some additional equipment needed, uh, UPS backup and stuff that needed to be built into the new facility. So, yeah, there was more required, but um, the business, you know, we had a lot of cash coming in, so we were able to write checks for a lot of these, insul right. uh, these ancillary. And then finally, there was a lot of time involved in the food production business because you did Absolutely. you did a, a round series of financing so here well, are the takeaways that's right. here are the takeaways right. the takeaways are that in every one of those instances you had to first plan for the financing the realization you needed it uh, how much you needed mm -hmm. in what form mm -hmm. was best for the business right. uh, how were you were going to deploy your efforts, your relationships uh, out there, in, in every case, it was relationship-driven, okay? Yes, Which, yes. that's one of the elements in the line in the sand that's changed because Absolutely. there's so many people out there, you can't, as a small businessman, maintain all those relationships. You don't even know where to start them in most cases. Right. And, and the complexity changed over time. And as a, the other takeaway right. is, you needed more help in analyzing some of the business decisions that needed to be made to better complement the capital formation uh, process you were in. Absolutely. Okay? Absolutely. And so we come back to prior planning prevents poor performance. You did that all the way through. You planned, you performed, but in the end, it wound up costing you a lot of time. And, and yet there still wasn't enough money at the end of the day because... An analyst would have come in and said, hey, you need a million five, you need two points, whatever it was. And you need a, a much more, um, how shall I say? Flexible. Uh, flexible, but also a, a more aggressive strategy to uh, grow into either the infrastructure that you're paying for right. because you're underutilizing it, or you need to size down, size down so, that, so that there's a good match between the utilization and the, the actual business cash flow. strategy complementing what occurs on the P&L. What you need in the way of capital formation, those are the takeaways. So good, so powerful, and I'm happy to share it here because it's so instructive to our uh, viewers, our listeners, and all of that. So thanks, George. Good stuff. Good all stuff right. today, buddy. We'll do that one. That was great. All right, so uh, that's it for this edition. We'll see you next week, and uh, thanks, George. More Just Ask George 2.0. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.